Hey, thanks for joining us today. My name is Jacques. I'm a co-founder and chief product officer here at Push. So in a previous life, I was uh, an offensive security researcher, ran a team of security consultants. Today, I'm also responsible for internal security at Push, which to a SaaS native company like us means by and large SaaS security. So this is actually great for me because when I talk to CISOs for product research, I get to take whatever I learn there and improve our internal security program. So really it's in that mindset that I want to share with you what we've learned. And while I won't be talking in great detail about the push platform, uh, hopefully you get an understanding for the problem that we built it to solve, really what we think that solution looks like. So before we jump in, let me give you a quick overview of what I'm covering today um, so you can stick around for the bits that interest you. First, I'm going to talk about the changes in the SaaS landscape, impact of self-adoption, what's driving it, why I think this is such an important signal for security. Next, I'm going to be arguing that we need to really embrace the future rather than try and fight it. And really, we need to move from a no until a default blocking mindset to a yes and less, sort of an enabling mindset, not explain exactly what I mean by that. I'm going to give you some practical advice for how to manage SaaS security distilled into four key takeaways. Uh, and finally, uh, I'm going I'm, I'm to leave you with a sort of slightly deeper dive um, into the more technical aspects for those that are interested. So I'll be touching on something like data sources and a few topics that often come up. So things like how SAML SSO fits into the picture. So let's jump straight in. And what better place to start than the word I've been using to describe this topic, SaaS, software as a service. Um, it's getting to be a pretty fuzzy term lately. Uh, maybe it's always been. Uh, but it's interpreted slightly differently by everyone. Um, so just to be clear in this talk, I'm going to use SaaS or just work apps interchangeably as a shorthand for any web application that's hosted by a third party, which has some work use cases. So this includes some fairly well understood things like Salesforce, Google Workspace, the things that often have developer and admin teams that manage them. But I think it's especially useful to focus on the hundreds or even thousands of apps that are so often overlooked and fall in that blind spot we call shadow IT. So the kinds of things that employees or business units are adopting and managing themselves without going through IT. So how do we get to this world where it's so easy for new work apps to be adopted without IT being involved? So many security pros will recognize some of the software adoption processes that allow business users to make a case for new software. You know, as administrators and operators, IT needs to review the software, make sure they can run it. Security needs to do a risk review. If no red flags are raised, software is deployed and users are onboarded. Um, this is obviously massively simplified, but you get the gist. And the reason I bring this up is that today we're seeing something which is radically different. So employees being onboarded is often the first step in the process rather than the last step. Um, this is happening because employees are adopting the apps by creating new tenants or workspaces with a few button clicks all on their own. Um, and why is that? What's led to the shift? So obviously the advent of SaaS and the, the, the sort of shift to software becoming consumed as an on-demand service accessed over the internet is part of it. Uh, but I don't think that's a root cause. For that, I think we may look at something called PLG. So what is PLG? Um, it's not some new provisioning protocol used by IT. In fact, it's, it stands for product-led growth. So back in 2019, a young SaaS marketeer called Wes Bush published his book, Product-Led Growth. Um, in it, he shows SaaS vendors how they can increase their sales revenues while reducing their sales cycles and costs by using their products as the primary go-to-market. So this is quite a mouthful. Um, sounds more complicated than this. So basically, rather than using traditional sales teams, Customers prefer to experience the value of a product themselves directly rather than being told about it by salespeople. So the reason PLG is changing the software adoption so radically is in order to establish a product-led go-to-market, SaaS vendors need to need end users to try their product either as a free, as a free trial or on a free tier um, and really to experience value from it. That's the core thing. So. If they do this, then the business becomes slightly reliant on that product, so it becomes sticky as a sort of icky term that, that's often used here. Um, and then they become motivated, you know, the user becomes motivated to champion that app internally. They basically do the selling for the vendor. So PLG not only relies on users being the initial adopters of the new app, but for them to find sort of meaningful value very early on in that process, which, which practically means that the app needs to interact with real data. That's the core thing. So obviously this poses a problem from a security standpoint. Um, you know, if vendors are deliberately bypassing 
the slow traditional software procurement process, um, that same process that gave you the ability to or visibility of which third parties had access to your data. And instead, they're targeting your employees directly uh, and encouraging them to plug these apps into live environments. One oddity here is that IT and security folk are usually ahead of the curve when it comes to tech shifts. But in this case, many have missed exactly how big the, the, this change has been. And the reason for this is that IT and security tools are among the least product-led of any sector. Most of our tools require heavy integrations, complicated setup, agent deployments, you know, so on. Unfortunately, few security companies are making tools as easy to set up and use as new marketing, sales, finance, dev, engineering, design, legal, HR, basically every other sector that can't rely on having, you know, basically an admin as the first user. So this leads us to a bit of a, I guess, a naive misconception that all sort of non-tech apps, which IT and security folk don't recognize, don't contain any particularly sensitive data. Like even though, you know, a pretty brief reflection on the data that these teams handle should put some real questions around that assumption. Uh, but beyond the data in these apps, even the apps that have absolutely no dangerous data can be part of the attack surface. For, yeah. For example, you might have an act, you might have an employee sharing the same password between a high risk app and a low risk app. Uh, and if that low risk app is then compromised, the high risk app could be as well. So. It's also interesting to see that new tools are often much more focused than the traditional on-site versions that they replace. So you might have some old monolith uh, installed on a server and that's not being replaced by a single SaaS app. So very often it's being replaced by a whole ecosystem of apps, each more focused and more specialized. So these apps integrate with each other, they extend the functionality of the whole stack. And, and basically as the team using the stack learns what they need, they're adding apps to add functionality. So another thing is these apps are also virtually zero maintenance. I mean, no one has to do OS patching or at least not the customer using the thing. Um, and so duplicate apps are really not so much of an issue anymore. And these two factors together mean that the sheer number of apps being used is increasing dramatically. The result of all of this is what's called shadow IT. I mean, actually, I'm not, I'm not crazy about that term. It's a bit old school and sort of implies that if IT isn't running software, there's sort of inherently a problem. Um, I think many organizations are becoming pretty comfortable with teams owning and managing their own software. And really what they aren't happy with is losing security, visibility, and control uh, for these apps. So perhaps we should call these sort of shadow risks or something. Uh, but whatever we call this, we're basically talking about this unmonitored attack surface that isn't known to the security team and they they're ref, they're, they're therefore really can't defend. So it's a big challenge for security teams and, and it's an even bigger opportunity for attackers looking for soft targets. So the natural thing to try and do is to regain some control, right? And for many teams, the first go-to approach is a policy level. So I haven't really heard of anyone having great success with this. Maybe you have, um, but typically I think it's because it's really difficult. It's already difficult enough to make just employees, users aware of the policy. Um, and even if the policy is as simple as, you know, just let security know if you start using a new app, it turns out that employees will quickly change uh, that policy wording and reinterpret it to, you know, something like, well, if I'm done testing and I'm absolutely sure I want to keep using this app forever, then I should let security know. And more often than not, that decision point doesn't exactly come. And so the notification never happens. So usually at this point, teams reach for a tech solution. Often the functionality they want is the ability to sort of block apps by default. So they want to have all apps essentially unsanctioned until they sanction them. Uh, so CASB tool to block things at the network level might be the thing. So this forces employees to ask for apps to be unblocked. So again, this takes us back into the old process, uh, which, you know, the good thing is it allows security teams the time to review the security implications before allowing an app. Um, but really, we're not asking the whole business to bend to the IT process where the default answer is no, right? So at least no until security has taken some kind of action and approved a change to unblock the app. So this is that kind of no until mindset. I'm going to skip over whether this process is technically practical in a modern work environment. I mean, TLDR, I don't think so. But instead, it's interesting to hear from those that have tried. And you know, when I talk to users about this, um, from the few that have tried doing this, I normally hear a story that goes something along the lines of, right, we tried to do this a few years ago. We blocked all file sharing apps other than the official apps. 
had sort of constant requests for other apps for specific teams or a single employee, like specific use cases. So while we were trying to decide what to allow, we um, realized some employees had actually started using their home PCs to bypass these corporate controls and, and access files that partners had shared with, with them over, you know, using blocked apps. So quickly realized that this was doing more harm than good. We abandoned that. So it's kind of addictive to the core problem of this uh, no until approach. Um, and this no until approach feels like the right approach for security. Um, and maybe it is if you're looking only at security. Um, but when you roll that out into a whole organization, um, it's normally seen as really blocking the business. So if you block the business, it normalizes an attitude that it's okay to work around security to get things done. So if you block websites, employees are going to bo- bypass network controls. If you block social logins, employees will use passwords. If you stop them using work devices to sign up to apps, they use personal devices. So it's not because they are trying to do something wrong. In fact, the opposite. They think what they're doing is right overall, everything considered, right? So each no until each default no action you take um, really leads to a worse security outcome, blinds the security team even further, uh, and they end up losing control rather than regaining it. So I mean, the obvious question is, one, what's, what's the alternative? Well. I think this is the point where we really need to reevaluate the default position. Right? This is a chance for us to stop fighting the future, stop talking about wanting to be business enablers and actually do it. There's also a real opportunity here to do something many security teams talk about doing and rarely happens. So sharing the work of securing the business would have been a meaningful way with the wider team. So to do that, we need to move from a default no until we do something to a default yes unless we find a specific reason not to. So unless we identify some specific risk. So what does this actually look like? A really meaningful way to start enabling the business is to stop asking it to adapt and work around an IT and security process, but instead meet folks halfway, right? Understand the user's workflow as a starting point. So let's look at that quickly. Um, So typically an employee on their own initiative or after a team discussion tries to find a tool to solve some specific problem or they want to look at a tool that was recommended to them. They create a free account on that tool. Um, You know, they click around a little bit soon. They wonder if there's another tool that does something slightly better. So they might sign up to two, three other tools, um, you know, other work apps. Well, technically the company now has accounts and has adopted, you know, maybe four apps. uh, They aren't really posing much risk, at least not yet. So next the employee uses or chooses their, you know, they sort of shortlist their favorite app or apps. They might invite a colleague or two to their instance or team or workspace or whatever it's called in that app. And they're now more likely to start putting the real work data into the, the app for testing, right? Next, they might invite a few more people. They might integrate the app with other things in the same sort of platform or stack. They incrementally invest enough time into the app that it becomes useful, right? So start becoming something that a business process relies on. Um, At this point, the app has sort of become de facto adopted. So often accounts stay in free tier for months or or even a year before, you know, they need to upgrade or, you know, typically this is something like they need to add another user and they've run out of free users or they need to unlock some kind of new feature and they need a paid account for this. And this is the point to which the finance team is, is typically involved. So... It's hard to say at what point the app was adopted. Um, Clearly in the beginning, fuzzy by the end, definitely. Um, And the risk really isn't Boolean either, you know, sort of like as the app becomes more broadly adopted in a team, they start processing more data, we see the risk gradually increasing as it gets more integrated. So if we want to move to a mode where we are defaulting to saying yes, Right, unless there's a reason to put brakes on, we can balance this with where that app is in the adoption journey. So this means early on, while there's little risk, we don't really have to block. We can say yes without taking much risk. We have time to work alongside the user in parallel, right? So while we say yes, we've got some time to go and find an unless. We go and find and see if there is actually a reason to, to, to change that yes. We might ask a user to give us a little more time to review, um, you know, before they invest any more of their time if we spot indicators. Uh, But ultimately, in this way, each employee doesn't need to know exactly how the IT process works. They don't need to know who to notify every time they're trying out a new new tool. Instead, the security team can actually automatically detect that these apps are being adopted, um, uh, you know, created. And this is actually the, the, the trigger for the process to start. Hopefully you're intrigued.
But I imagine you're pretty skeptical about this approach. So the foundation here is really the ability to detect SaaS app creations, logins, new integrations, um, and for that to kick off this new process so that you actually can initiate this parallel flow. So there are a number of ways to do this. And, and the following four key points, I hope, will make it clear what's needed uh, to make this effective. So the first thing I'm going to say is I recommend very strongly that you focus on the new stuff. So a question I, I often ask CISOs is, what would it take for you to try and migrate a group of users off an app that they currently love because you've discovered a new security issue with that? And yeah, uh, I guess you're feeling the sense of dread. Um, it's typically incredibly difficult to, to actually get this migration going. Um, it's not just technically difficult, it's also politically difficult. You know, I mean, you have to spend so much goodwill to do an app, uh, you know, a migration like this and deal with all the, the, the fallout of this. Um, so, so it's typically only happens when there's a truly unacceptable risk or, or some massive compliance issue. So the main reason that you focus on new apps and integrations rather than spending the majority of your time working on the backlog of already adopted apps, right? So if you focus on the apps that are still shortlisting or in the testing phases, it's much easier to steer the course towards a lower risk alternative or, or pump the brakes when there really is a significant risk and there is no good alternative. Um, basically, you need to do this before people invest a lot of their own time, right? So this is not to say that doing risk assessments or due diligence on apps that have been in use for a while is pointless. Um, identifying those risks are clearly important, but the likelihood of a risk being identified and then actually getting actioned into migrating users off an app, um, you know, is, is very, at least much slimmer. Um, so this is kind of a, akin to that story of the man looking for his keys near the street light. Uh, and basically because that's the only place he has a chance of finding them. So in this new, yes, unless we have a reason not to mode, um, the default answer is yes. Uh, and, and only if there's a significant security concern do you change that. You're also focusing on the new stuff where you get the highest ROI of your efforts. Um, so you need to react and find an unless while the app is still new. In other words, while it's still being tested or adopted. Um, or compared between alternatives, right, before it's adopted. So your goal is to give a security team as much time to be involved in a decision as possible. It's far less useful if, you're, you know, if you discover an app once the team is already talking to finance about upgrading a paid subscription after using it for a year. You know, at that point, so much time and effort has been invested in the specific app that it's, it's very difficult to actually motivate any change. Really, the best you will be, yeah, I mean, you're going to be in a position where it's basically, let's do as much as we can to, to secure this app mode. Right, so the way to give the security team as much time as possible is to reduce the delta between a user taking an action, so a user opening a new app instance, adopting a new app, creating a new integration, uh, and the security team finding out about it. Ideally, you should find a way to find out about these new apps being adopted in real time within hours, you know, rather than days or weeks. It's typically too slow. So if you you know, if your goal is going to be, let's just discover which SaaS apps are getting used, we'll just get a rough inventory, um, then typically high, high accuracy isn't really that necessary. You can probably live with a lot of false positives. Um, the crucial thing here is that many teams on getting some eyes on this problem uh, really want to do something about it. Uh, and this is the insight, right, is that when you start doing something, you don't want to switch data sources. You don't want to use one data source um, to basically understand the scope of the problem and a different data source to start fixing the problem. Okay, so what is that first step of fixing the problem? What is that first action you're taking? You might want to start a conversation with the, the, the first employee is using the app. Uh, you might want to ask them how they intend to use the app. You might want to review the app and the data it's likely to process. Whatever, this action is likely to consume some cycles from your team. It's going to cost time. And so any actions you take on bad information is going to be a time waster. So common example, you know, it's a pretty bad experience for the security team and the employee if the security team asks them about a, a new app they just started using, when in fact, they just clicked around on the homepage or they received a marketing email from the app. Like, I mean, employees will also notice pretty quickly if the security team can't tell the difference between browsing an app website and actually registering an account on an app. If the security team needs to first confirm and double check each data point, um, through some other unspecified process. And that seriously increases the amount of work you need to do before you can take the action. So really accurate data is the thing that turns this problem from something which is 
impossible to something which is pretty manageable even at scale. Right, so the last takeaway, this one kind of feels like it's building on the previous ones, but you know, every previous one has been building on each other. This one feels like it does as well, but, but the insight is actually that it doesn't. Um, so let me take a step back, Craig. So really, in those first three, we were talking about vendor risk levels. So asking questions like, is it possible to use this app securely? Can we accept the risk of trusting this vendor? Basically, supply chain risk. Um, perhaps we're, you know, the, the answers are things like, you know, yes, we're okay to use this app. Maybe there are some restrictions on how we can use the app. Um, you know, maybe in some rare cases, we're saying like, actually, this app specifically under no circumstances. But that's only half of the problem, right? That's, that's unfortunately where most of people's attention is in the supply chain risk. What happens if the vendor gets compromised? But the other half of the equation is actually a lot more boring, but this is where the problems happen. And that's basically, are we using this app securely? In other words, what's the actual residual risk, regardless of whether it's been reviewed or not? So in the SaaS paradigm, the vendor is responsible for securing the app, all the layers below it, that's your supply chain risk, right? Your responsibility as a user or a customer is to secure the accounts on their app. Um, and so, you know, on some accounts, Maybe there are some security settings that you can harden, uh, but really today, if things go wrong 99% of the time, um, maybe that's an overstatement, but close to, it's gonna be an account security issue, not a supply chain issue. So I could do a whole other talk on new SaaS attack techniques like consent phishing, persistence tokens, and a dozen more. But today, the most likely attack that's gonna lead to a breach of your data in the real world is credential stuffing. So this is basically that attack where Attackers take a list of breached passwords, breached credential dumps, um, and they retarget those credentials against different apps. So if we're going to cover anything, we should probably at least cover the most, the most common attack, right? The good news here is that the ways to prevent this are pretty easy to understand. We're talking about basic account security controls. So don't reuse passwords between apps, check if users are using MFA, Make sure the passwords don't show up in breach lists. You know, make it make sure employees are using strong passwords, password managers, and well, and in fact, if we can, let's just get rid of passwords altogether by using SSO. So these are really easy recommendations to make. They're much harder to implement. I get that, especially if you have to do it across hundreds of apps at scale without having admin access to most of these apps. So how do companies deal with this? How would you deal with this? So the approach that some CISOs are taking is to make SSO, single sign-on, specifically SAML single sign-on, a requirement before allowing or approving an app. So only SAML SSO apps are approved or can be approved. So I think using SAML is a pretty great idea. SAML allows true single sign-on. It's pretty much the gold standard for authentication. Make sure that we aren't reusing any passwords. There's just one account, there's just one password. We can effectively centrally deprovision accounts when employees leave. Um, you're probably already paying for a SAML IDP like Google Directory or Azure AD, uh, but many other tool, but many others are using tools like Okta. Um, obviously, SSO isn't gonna help you discover that these apps are getting used, right? You need to discover them before you can integrate them. But once you've discovered them and the app supports SAML, you can then find Oh, well, you will likely find that many of these apps are going to require that you upgrade to a pretty expensive enterprise license. For core apps, yeah, this probably makes sense. Uh, but for most organizations, paying for enterprise licenses for every single tenant of every app simply isn't practical. I'm really hoping that the, the SSO tax movement, Google that if you don't know about it, is effective um, and is going to apply the pressure needed to change this. But Today, I, I'm honestly not sure in which direction that trend is moving. There are a lot of other nuances when looking at, at SAML, um, such as that SAML integration covering only one tenant uh, or, or instance, not the entire app. Uh, so every time you find a new workspace or instance, you need to integrate that again. Often you can only integrate one with a SAML IDP. Um, so there are other issues like onboarding flows that work outside SSO, like inviting guests, external sharing. So this is a bit more detail than I have time for now, but I have actually published a blog post on this, which might be interesting if you want to understand this in a little more depth. Cutting all of that, the really big 800 pound gorilla of a problem you're going to find is that relatively few apps support SAML. Um, 
especially the latest and therefore the, the less mature apps. So Push reviewed nearly 500 of the most used apps uh, across all our customers. Um, and it turns out less than one third of them even claim to support SAML on any license tier. So this leads to a very difficult decision. Either you're going to deny access to the majority of apps. Um, and so granted, this is the majority apps, which the majority in number and uh, not necessarily the most popular apps which have been around for a long time and are the most recognizable, but still by sheer number, the majority of apps, right? Um, either through policy or technical controls, or you have to deal with passwords, right? We've already discussed the, the problems with, with blocking these things and the likelihood that this is going to drive SaaS use even deeper into the shadows, um, especially if users know that the apps won't be approved. Um, they have very little incentive to even ask if that's the case. So because of this, most users I've spoken to have chosen a SSO when practical route. Um, that's certainly the case that we've taken. Um, in either case, you're almost certainly going to need to secure a lot of passwords, at least for the start of the app lifecycle, um, unless PLG goes away. Uh, honestly, I'm not holding my breath. So how do you deal with account security issues? So you've SSO'd what is SSOable. Um, now you have a bunch of other you know, SaaS apps where people are using passwords to log in. I can tell you what we did internally a few years ago when we started Push as a, as a tiny team. We, we SSO'd what we could, the three apps at the time. Um, then we had a few dozen other apps. Um, so we implemented a quarterly account review. Uh, we did a manual audit of each user's SaaS accounts every quarter, jumped on a video call, asked them to log into each app we discovered. This is not quick. It's not exciting. It's pretty boring. Uh, we made sure they had MFA enabled. We made sure they were using long, strong passwords. Uh, signed up to have I been pwned to check if accounts showed up in breach dumps. But this process became, I mean, basically impossible, even as we hit sort of 10, 20 people. Uh, so we started sampling. Pretty soon that sample was small and it doesn't even really feel like it's worth the time. So yeah, <laughs> it's not a great way to go. And it definitely doesn't scale. I think I want to show you an alternative, right? What if auditing account security, so weak passwords, breach passwords, passwords that are shared between apps and accounts, whether F MFA is in place or not, what if those checks that came along for the ride, right? You just got them completely automatically as part of the app discovery process. And it turns out that this is possible um, if you're looking in the right place. So I said things were going to get a little bit more technical near the end, um, but bear with me. I'll show you a little bit about what the output of, the, of this slide means on the next slide. Uh, so we've been skirting around the issue of how you do any of this technically. And really the key element to discuss here is the data source you use. I've summarized what we've learned while doing a lot of research into the various data sources available to do SaaS security. Uh, let me run you through this, a, a very simplified version of this. Um, there's obviously a lot more worth saying. Um, please ping me if you've got questions or want to discuss this. Uh, there are almost too many caveats to mention, but you can use quite a few data sources to infer that an employee is using an app. So rather, like, rather than directly observing it, you can, you can infer because you're seeing some kind of other signal. So this could be network data, emails they receive from a vendor, uh, bills for licenses. So just quickly look at each of those. So network data, pretty self-explanatory. We're talking about a connection between a user or really a user's endpoint and a web app, perhaps through a firewall log, perhaps through an endpoint agent, wherever it comes from, um, you're going to have a similar problem, right? And that problem is false positives. The reason for those false positives is that it's incredibly difficult to tell the difference between a connection to a web app and an authenticated connection to a web app, unless you do a whole TLS unpack and you have a whole host of other problems if you go that route. So, Really, because you're going to deal with a lot of these, because you're only inferring usage, right? It's going to be impossible for you to do things like have they actually logged in? Have they logged in using a work account, using a personal Gmail account? Are they using a good password? Do they have MFA in place? Uh, uh, so false positives, and you're going to have a pretty shallow depth of, of, of view on, on account security issues. Emails from a vendor, okay, also a really strong signal that an app might be in use. But because these emails change pretty much constantly, there's a sort of permanent battle to tell marketing emails and product emails apart. So again, false positives are going to creep in. Um, 
And often you need to observe multiple emails to, to make a fairly good guess. So if you've received one email from a vendor, probably not a good guess that it's using, but by the time you've received 100, yeah, then, then it's much, much clearer. So you're going to have some trade-off there. Um, and so this can basically be either slow or inaccurate. So except in weird edge cases, you generally can't tell if users are using strong passwords, whether they have MFA enabled, um, just by looking at app emails. Finance records don't have this false positive problem. Mostly if you're paying for an app, um, it's being used. Um, it does miss free tier apps. Often it takes months to detect product-led apps. You certainly aren't detecting MFA use, weak passwords through builds either. Finally, uh, I've added API integrations with apps. You know, for some apps that do provide security useful APIs, which are a fairly small number, SSO tools, Google Workspace, Azure AD, uh, Google Drive, so directory, sorry. Um, so even though these apps can't be used to detect SaaS apps being used, um, once you do and you integrate them, they can help you understand or, or, or minimize account security issues with some heavy limitations. But basically, this is where we got to, where, where it became clear that the only really good data source um, was the browser extension. This is the only data source that we could find that actually protects you against the most common attack technique credential stuffing. Nothing else lets you discover password and MFA issues across hundreds of apps automatically while at the same time giving you really observing SaaS usage rather than just inferring it. Uh, we believe this is the right data source to build the SaaS security program on. I'm not going to do a whole demo uh, of the push app, uh, but I did promise I'd show you what this data looks like. So um, I want to show you two quick screenshots from, from the product. Uh, the first one is just the, the SaaS discovery dashboard. So every time we observe a user creating a new account or logging into, into a SaaS app or work app, it basically shows up in this table. You can see how they're accessing each of these apps. Are they using passwords? Are they using social logins? Are there any issues for that platform? You can see the, the, the there's a, an, an example of a chat ops message when a, new, when a new integration is created, when a new app is onboarded. The first time a user onboards an app, you can get a, you can get a chat ops notification. So in that way, you really do get that real-time notification when this is happening. All right, the second screenshot I want to show you is the uh, account security page. And so here you can see where all those common sense controls are missing. So where accounts don't have MFA enabled, where employees are reusing passwords between accounts. Um, and we're also doing chat ops here, but this time directly to the end user. So this is actually quite a big part of push security where we, 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 we employ a, a sort of user-centric approach where we take these findings, we actually directly contact users on Slack or Teams, uh, if you enable this, if you want this, um, and we'll work with the employees to actually resolve these issues automatically without involving the security team. Um, but even better than that, uh, the browser extension employs some guardrails which will stop users from, from making, you know, creating findings uh, in the first place. If you're interested in seeing more, we'd love to show you a demo of how this all fits together. Uh, please get in touch if you're interested. There are a ton of other things I haven't had time to go into. Like I mentioned earlier, new attacks against SaaS apps, how they work, looking at third-party integrations, OAuth tokens, so much more. Um, if you're interested in these or any other topics, let me know and uh, I'll figure out what the next webinar is going to be on. Uh, thanks for joining us today. I'm going to leave things there, but uh, I'll be around answering questions uh, in the comment section below uh, for the next few minutes uh, if you have any. Thanks. Bye-bye.